At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I'm casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I finished my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way. Because it's impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I have desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. And you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you'll not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord lives forever. This is the word of the Lord. All thanks be to God. I think we've probably all watched enough TV and movies to know that when the government's looking for you, you know you're in trouble. I just saw an interesting movie called Bridge of Spies, and it's actually based off of a book, which is based off of a true story. Uh, it's an interesting movie starring Tom Hanks about a time during the Cold War when a Russian spy was caught over here and an American spy was caught in Russia. And a story is told about the effort of a lawyer uh, who was called upon to negotiate a trade with Russia for each spy to be returned home. Now right at the beginning it follows the Russian spy here in the US and he's doing his secret spy stuff. And it shows how calculated he is about it. Uh, as you see him, that's what he's doing in this picture. Uh, as you see him split a fake nickel in half to remove this tiny little piece of paper that has these secret codes on it. Shortly after that, a convoy of FBI cars show up outside his apartment building. Something like 10 to 20 government agents rush inside and they catch the spy uh, who was in the bathroom inside of his apartment at the time, totally taken off guard. He's arrested quickly, his court, date, his court case is set up, and it's set up only as a show, really. Um, the judge, jury, and everyone else around is already convinced the guy is guilty, which he was. And they were just going through the motions to provide this image of him being given a fair trial. I mean, the guy never had a chance. And the FBI had been on him for plenty long enough, and they just pounced on him once they were ready to bring him in, and it just proceeded quickly from there. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter that this was 20th century America. Uh, the idea here is pretty typical. The government tends to be a very strong and relatively well-organized force, especially compared to the average citizen and one person alone. If they want you, they'll usually know how to find you and catch you and follow through with their intentions. As they say, nothing is certain but death and taxes. Taxes are certain because you don't want the government's eye on you. And they'll get their money one way or another. At any rate, this morning we've got Jesus knowing full well that the government's eye is upon him. Some Pharisees are warning him, get out of here. Herod wants to kill you. Now I actually had to take a second glance to catch that, that, that this is the Pharisees who seem to be watching out for him here. I'd expect that more from the disciples uh, who didn't quite understand everything at the time uh, but would certainly be watching out for him in that way. Um, the Pharisees aren't exactly known for being on Jesus' side. Uh, and whether they like him or not, apparently they don't want him to die. At least not at this point in the story. 
And of course, there, there could be some hidden intentions there. Maybe um, they just didn't want him around and, uh, or, or whatever, but there's nothing in the story to, to lead us to that conclusion. It's, it's kind of left for us to wonder, but it kind of seems like they're on his side here, and they want him to not die. King Herod was known to be very brutal. After all, this was the guy who not long before this conversation had John the Baptist beheaded. Get out of here, Jesus. Herod wants to kill you, they say. In response, Jesus says, Go and tell that fox, that sneaky little predator. Listen, I'm working right now, all right? I'm casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I'll finish my work. Now, just with this part, we've got a few things going on. When Jesus says today and tomorrow, he doesn't mean literally. As you can imagine, there's often a lot of symbolism and uh, hyperbole in the, in the scriptures and whatnot. Um, basically, Jesus is saying every day I'm casting out demons and performing cures. He says today and tomorrow. He's saying every day, this is what I'm doing. I'm busy. I'm working. And the third day is obviously a reference to the resurrection. Jesus is laying out that he's got his own timetable here. Herod, despite all of his power, all of his might, despite his, his brutal reputation, uh, he's not going to cut short that timetable that Jesus is on. Things are going to play out according to how it fits into Jesus' mission. Jesus is going to do his work, and Herod can't do anything about it. Jesus already knows that he's got death knocking at his door. And as Jesus continues, we see that more clearly. I must be on my way, because it's impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is well known for its harsh and unwelcoming reputation toward the prophets. And Jesus identifies himself as a prophet here. He's much more than that, but a prophet is certainly a part of who he is. His ministry is very prophetic, which is very dangerous in the eyes of the powerful. And he identifies Jerusalem as the place where he will die. He's not to Jerusalem yet at this point in the story, so Herod wanting to kill him pretty much means nothing. In addition to this conversation, displaying Jesus' courage and determination, it's also a sad moment as Jesus pauses to lament over his beloved Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. With the mother's compassion, he continues, How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. And you were not willing. Because of that, you're on your own. And you won't see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, of course, that last line is what people holler out when Jesus enters in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. To me, the saddest thing about all this is the people's unwillingness to be gathered under the Lord's wings. That's why Jesus has to die for them. That's why sin runs so rampant. That's what opens the door for evil to creep in. That's the source of so much suffering. Their simple unwillingness to turn themselves over to the Lord completely. When Jesus laments as a mother hen, I don't think he's speaking only his words here, but God's words as well. Now think of that. How many times God tried to gather in the people throughout their history? All that God's done to try to get them to change their ways. 
How many people have been sent for them? How many prophets have been sent for them? How many different ways God has tried to reach them? Yet how many times they've resisted and insisted on doing what they want. As we see Jesus lament over Jerusalem, we are invited to lament with him. To feel that sadness over the people being so stubborn. And over what Jesus is going to have to do to deal with it. Not only that, but we're also invi invited to join in Jesus' lament over us. Jerusalem was its own place with its own situation. But it represents all of us. It's a symbol for how not willing we are to be gathered under God's wings together. Our own willingness, our own unwillingness that opens the door for evil to creep in. That allows sin to run so rampant in our lives and throughout society. Our unwillingness that causes so much suffering. How many people have been sent to us? How many modern day prophets? How many different ways God has tried to reach us? Yet how many times we've insisted on doing what we want? Now eventually the government will get its way with Jesus. He'll be caught. He'll stand trial. A trial that is really just for show. As everyone involved will already believe Jesus is guilty. Even though he's not. He'll be tortured. And he'll be killed. Like a common criminal on the cross. But with Jesus, it's not really the government's power that causes it to happen. It's the people who are not willing to change. That's actually what gives Jesus a death sentence. We can't do anything about Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, but we can do something about us. We can look seriously into our own lives and identify how we've wandered astray. We can let go of our unwillingness to change. We can learn to love one another as God loves us. And we can be willing to do so. But will we? This being the season of Lent, it's a golden opportunity for us to get more serious about our relationship with God. May we turn our unwillingness into willingness. May we be willing to turn ourselves over completely to the Lord. And may we be gathered together under God's wings. Amen.